Uh, so today we are going to talk about the evolution of water resources management. And at the end of the class, you will be, uh, you will be able to describe the paradigm shift and evolution of water resources management in, in general. But also you can critically evaluate the importance of IWRM for water diplomacy and also water energy food nexus and its relation with um, water diplomacy and also importance of water diplomacy for achieving sustainable development goals. Today's talk is regarding a, a new approaches, um, recent approaches of water resources management and sustainable development goals and its relation with water diplomacy. Uh, in this figure, I try to summarize uh, from uh, taken from these references, uh, how the water resource management has evolved throughout the time. It has four metrics. You can see that from the centralized management to decentralized management uh, in the vertical axis. And from centralized management, it means a yeah, centralized form of governance where a stakeholder engagement and participation is uh, the possibility of uh, stakeholder engagement is very low, but when it moves to the decentralized form of governance, it can include stakeholder engagement from local peoples and local participations. And in the horizontal axis, you can see from the supply side management to the demand side the management. In the left um, upper corner, this is the traditional development of water resources management, not only water resources management, any development started from this side. So it's highly centralized and uh, supply side approach. So th this is the first development pattern of water resources. So for example, in this case, only um, uh, option is to invest uh, how to create dams, construction, reservoirs. So this is the only consideration for, for the water resources management. And it's considered only engineering-based approach and it's very technocratic approach without considering societal aspects or economic aspects, mainly how to make the development and how the development pattern start and how the engineering structures can, can um, can help to um, make the development effective. So this is the only, only consideration in this phase. And um, then, so this is the position of A uh, in the left left hand side upper corner. And but slowly, it moves from A to B. And in that case, the um, from investment oriented decision, it moves, it, it takes consideration of the societal issues slowly. And then, so initial um, management paradigm considers mainly engineers, hydrologists and technocrats, but slowly they can understand that, that uh, this may create, this can create consequences to the society and they, they can try to understand the demand of the local people slowly and so they try to incorporate the uh, uh, they try to um, uh, realize that water is not only the uh, water, water is not only the um, development pattern or supply side management it, it needs to consider also societal and um, economic aspect and thus demand side options um, started and demand side management started and then slowly it moves to the C and in that case, institutional reformation start, or for example, decentralized form of governance institution. And um, yeah, so um, the from um, uh, engineering based structure of the management paradigms shift towards um, um, yeah, uh, different uh, disciplinary bodies in the management body, but also local engagement can also um, um, take place. So this is the overall broader um, evolution of the water resources ma management happens internationally and also many countries. So here I can give an example 
how it happens in Bangladesh because I know this um, uh, the context of Bangladesh water resources management how it um, happens throughout the time so I can also explain uh, the graph that I have shown and what happens practically in the Bangladesh case. So um, before 1947, Bangladesh was a part of the British colony. And um, during that time, there was no embankment to protect uh, flooding in Bangladesh. So um, in, th in that time, lo local people manage the embankment during the um, dry season to um, grow the crops. And in that case, landlords, uh, the British emperor provide um, uh, ownership to the landlord to manage uh, a specific area of land and through engaging local farmers, the landlords um, was, was responsible for managing flood protection embankments only during the um, dry season for growing crops. But during rainy season, that embankment was um, um, yeah, vanished uh, because of the um, rainfall and the river water could enter into the flood plain and it helps sedimentation and it, it increases the, uh, yeah, so land formation uh, was happening during that time because sediment could come into the uh, flood plain. And so this is kind of um, a natural process was maintained during that period. But after 1947, the British colony ended and uh, there is no institution like the landlord management territory was not there. And since then, um, this um, part of land was, uh, was part of Indian um, estate. So um, it was, um, so India and Pakistan was divided and Bangladesh was part of the East Pakistan during that time. And so during that time, there was no responsible authority to managing the embankment or flood plan. And during that time in 1954 and 55, there was a, um, a major flood events. And after that flood events, uh, flood uh, protection embankments was um, constructed in 1960s. And you see and the, during that period, heavy engineering works started. And, and in that case, the embankment protect the flooding uh, from the um, uh, river, but also um, 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 it, 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 it helps initially the agricultural uh, production highly. Uh, but slowly after a few years, uh, you know, this is um, this uh, this uh, river um, carries huge amount of sediment, and that sediment deposited in the floodplain, and that makes the land formation in the floodplain. But due to the embankment, this process was um, was not taken place uh, due to the construction of the embankment, and then the um, sedimentation was happening in the river bed, uh, river bed instead of the floodplain. So the flood plain, uh, the land formation was not happening in the flood plain, but those um, sedimentation um, was, uh, th those sediment was deposited in the riverbed and that uh, increased the riverbed and it reduces the navigability. At the same time, um, the internal water logging started. So in 1980s, this uh, whole area of flood plain becomes waterlogged and permanent flooding was, um, happening because of this construction of uh, embankment. So you see how the consequence started from the supply side approach um, without considering without uh, considering only the narrow focus of the supply side uh, process. So initially it helps in improving the agricultural production, but um, in the long run, it, it created um, a disaster to the local uh, people. So local people understood this process and they um, really understood the, uh, uh, what is happening there. So going uh, against, uh, against the government, they try to cut the embankment and uh, bring the river water inside the floodplain. And 
this process they call this uh, is tidal river management in 1990s so they try to implement this process going against uh, government process and they try to implement locally with, uh, with self organizing capacity and that they, they implemented in on uh, flood plain and they were successful and they um, after uh, two years they were able to um, see the um, major impact like um, navigability of uh, in the riverbed um, um, is increased and also um, the flood plain uh, the sedimentation was happening in the flood plain so um, then the government could also see the positive benefits so then they try to institutionalize this approach in the uh, in the government approach so how you can see how the transformation or evolution happened in in this context uh, similar explanation that i just gave in the in the previous slide just to show how how the evolution was uh, happening i uh, also try to explain um, how a paradigm shift in um, water resources ma management um, happened through the literature provided by claudia paul bosul um, she's one of the um, yeah um, uh, experts on adaptive water resources management or integrated water resources management and um, so in her work um, she tried to um, yeah categorize or explain different dimensions of um, water resources management from control, um, command and control approach to the integrated approach. So in the governance dimensions that the major paradigm shift happened from centralized form of governance to the, to the uh, polycentric form of governance uh, which um, incorporates bo both integration of top-down and bottom-up approach. And also in terms of sectoral integration in, in the case of um, um, command and control approach, um, um, in, in that case, the sectoral integration was not possible and it creates policy conflicts, but in the integrated uh, form integrated and adaptive form of ma management, the cross sectoral integration is possible, and um, that 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 also integrates policy implementation. So, um, uh, in the case of scale of analysis and operation, this transboundary problems emerge when river subbasins are exclusive scale of analysis and management. But uh, in the integrated form of governance, the transboundary issues addressed by multiple scale of analysis and management. And in the case of information management, um, understanding fragmented by gaps and lack of integration of proprietary, uh, proprietary um, information sources. But in the case of integrated form of governance, uh, this comprehensive understanding achieved by open shared information sources that fill gaps and facilitate integration. And um, there are also three other dimensions. So as uh, infrastructure, you can see that um, in, uh, in the first case is only the uh, command and control approach, um, massive centralized infrastructure design and engineering based structure is um, dominant but in the case of integrative um, integrative and adaptive water resource ma management this uh, incorporates combination of centralized and decentralized diverse source of uh, design and power delivery is very important and in terms of financial and risk um, management this this case is only structural protection and its risks are considered, but in the case of integrative management, diversified financial resources are um, considered for um, by considering broad set of private and public financial uh, instruments. 
And important aspect is dealing with uncertainty. In the case of command and control approach, it is considered that um, um, uncertainty is considered as undesirable sign of incomplete knowledge. So they don't know uh, what will happen and how to manage the uncertainty. And uh, this will create major problem, but adaptive and integrative ma management, um, um, the irreducible uncertainties are acceptable and the adaptive approach are taken how to deal with the future uncertain outcomes uh, by considering different, different uh, scenarios. For example, uh, different perspectives of explicit, um, different perspe uh, perspectives are explicitly uh, acknowledged. So here you can see uh, differentiation um, or difference between the uh, two approaches uh, from command and control to the integrative approach. So now uh, we would like to uh, introduce one of the major paradigm shift and major dominant um, paradigm of water resources management, which is integrated water resources management. And of course, this, this falls in the uh, uh, right hand side, the characteristics that I have uh, shown here. So integrative and uh, integrated water resources uh, management. Integrated water resources management is not new, although the is internationally um, conceptualized recently in um, the um, 20th century and at the end of 20th century is in, uh, introduced in the international arena, but um, there are ancient practices that incorporates the in, in, integrated, the major dimensions of integrated water resources management has been considered. For example, in ninth century, Subak irrigation system in Bali is one of the ancient irrigation practices who is um, practiced this integrated water resources ma management. Of course, without knowing the concept, but the, they try to incorporate the um, integration self-organization for um, um, managing the Bali irrigation systems through ancient um, um, practices. Uh, here, I wanted to sh share an, uh, a video, very short, video, but you can find interesting how they were able to manage this um, uh, super irrigation system in, in the Balinese agricultural uh, practices. So let me share this. You can see how self-organization and um, cooperative ma management of um, um, cooperative water management has taken place since that ancient time. And, and not only the um, Sobak system, but also there are other um, historical practices that incorporates this integrated form of uh, um, um, resource management practices. And other water resources management practices in um, Valencia, Spain, the multi-stakeholder participatory water tribunal have operated at least since 10th century. Uh, but but also um, uh, the modern form of integrated water resources ma ma management was influenced mainly by Tineze Valley Authority created in 1933 to holistically manage water re resources. So. Um, I, I don't know whether uh, you are familiar with the uh, Tineze Valley Authority. Did some of you are familiar with this? Uh, Larry, uh, do you know? Um, I, I, I know some uh, information, but probably you know better than me uh, regarding the TVA form of management approach. Well, TVA wasn't just set up as a water management body. The Tennessee Valley Authority um, had enormous scope of development, power, and responsibility. And one of the few times in the United States where there was development across a large region, more than just a city or a metropolitan area. This covered much more of an area, and it attempted to give 
public management to infrastructure at a scale that the United States wasn't used to. And um, it, as you, as you point out, it was uh, credited with being a planning mechanism, but given how anti-planning the United States has always been, um, I think it's more helpful to think about it as a development mechanism. And we had, and still have, but we had then lagging regions in terms of economic development. And the strategy was, uh, let's make a massive investment in a lagging region. Let's have all of the infrastructure, roads that connect it to other places, water that it needs, electricity or hydropower that it needs. Let's have all of the infrastructure done simultaneously and let's invest government funding at a large enough scale that it would then promote subsequent private investment and make it a sustainable place, but with a much larger role for government uh, managed infrastructure um, that never took off as an idea. We don't see other regions of the United States where lagging areas were um, targeted by an economic development strategy that said, let's have a massive public investment in all of the infrastructure, job creation, training, and let's not worry about state and local government and um, let's do it at a scale that turns around a lagging region because smaller scale efforts to turn around lagging regions don't work. So the, the way to understand this, the TVA story, and there are many books written about TVA, sort of longing for a regional publicly managed massive infrastructure uh, pr project that would uh, stimulate the economy in a way that wouldn't happen otherwise. Yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, also in the IWRM literature uh, globally, this um, TBA approach is highly acknowledged and uh, it says that the TBA-like approach um, mushroomed all over the world for um, uh, developing mainly agricultural development uh, in the developing countries. So um, that, that uh, culture has, has been practiced is, is also um, in um, other places and the regional development plan through incorporating, for example, um, power generation, flood control, and how this integration happens, um, and also the concept um, uh, integration of multiple sectors uh, in the IWRM also uh, came uh, from this TBA-like approach that is um, uh, mentioned in the IWRM literature. Yeah, so uh, before going to IWRM principles, maybe we can um, uh, have a um, participatory discussion here. Um, why IWRM is important for water diplomacy in your opinion? I, I wanted to make it a breakout group, but as we are only uh, five people, so maybe we can d discuss why in your opinion. Also, there was a memo question on this, so maybe we can discuss here. Uh, uh, discuss here why IWRM is important for water diplomacy. Well, I guess first, do you think it is? What What is it about integrated management of water resources that makes it an important element of dealing with transboundary waters? This is a little bit of low hanging fruit, but one of the readings observed that it's the dominant paradigm for water management globally. So it sort of is therefore important to diplomacy. But I think one of the other things that stood out to me, and I wrote a little bit about this in my, in my memo is just sort of efforts to move beyond diplomatic silos 
Um, there's there was an example in the loop at all piece that like really stood out to me about biofuels and how like the development of biofuels sort of subsequently catalyzed or exacerbated existing problems with water and food scarcity. So the need for like a more integration, a more integrated management approach felt sort of urgent and necessary as we as we move towards perhaps greater scarcity in, in certain water systems. But how would that work, or theoretically, how might that work in context in which we do have siloed entities responsible for things like water? And if you say, well, integrated management is the key mm. to managing water in the future so that you can connect water with energy, with food, with land, but that's not how those entities are set up right so yeah is, is aren't we basically setting up uh, to setting up systems to fail if we say that they have to be integrated in order to do water management when we know that they're not therefore what are we hoping for that is a good question um i don't know if i have an, an immediate answer i'll think about that though yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a right answer. I'm yeah. just, uh, it seems to me that from a, from a planning perspective, urban regional planning perspective, not a water perspective, there's always an argument for centuries that the way to plan cities effectively is to start with a clean, empty area and have a designer make a comprehensive integrated plan so that the land is used efficiently, so that all the uses are appropriately laid out and uh, separate from each other when that's appropriate. And that um, you don't have to have holes in the plan where there's private ownership or other things that happen. And you don't have to worry over time because you just started building in one corner. And by the time it was done, it was just a giant pattern that's a, a, of uncontrolled development, the idea has always been that you should plan whole cities in a comprehensive way. To me, IWRM has some of the same resonance, okay? Now, we know in real life, there are very, very few planned cities where the whole city was laid out and all of its evolution was guided by or controlled by the original plan. And it's very hard to have in a democratic context and one in which there's private land ownership, continuity with a single plan. And even in some parts of the world where historically there were efforts to plan whole new capitals, whole new cities, where they brought in a famous architect who made a beautiful plan for the whole place. <laughs> Over decades, the place changes from what the original design was for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is people want to have choice about what things are going to be look like and what they can do with what their land is and what say they have in a democratic context. So, uh, just for purposes of, 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 of pursuing further the question that I asked you, Gemma, is um, do you imagine that people in a democratic context can live in, in, and work and build in a way that's comprehensive, integrated, and planned when all the forces of democracy, privatization, individuality and all the unexpected things that happen or organically pull in the opposite direction. I mean, I think I have to say yes, but that's sort of my prerogative as a first semester urban planning student. Like if you, I've already given up on the field, then it may be too late for me. Um, I think the, some healthy skepticism isn't uncalled for, I guess. I mean, it's, 
I don't know. I guess it's what is sort of resonant about IWRM and like the water nexus approach and like sort of science policy interfaces more broadly is the kind of potential to reimagine existing diplomatic regimes. But I don't know whether that actually will work in practice. So maybe it's just an intellectual exercise, but I think it's a useful intellectual exercise. Well, it's only useful if it inspires something in practice that can be done, right? Yeah. It's not useful if it alludes to something in theory that can't be done in practice and everybody's just thwarted and can't achieve what they're supposed to or the ideal. Um, and just to, come to, to loop back around again to urban planning, nobody in urban planning teaches about comprehensive planned cities anymore, except as an intriguing historical artifact. Nobody would imagine that you would build a place according to a plan at time one and expect at time two, a decade, two decades, a century later, that the place is going to have anything to do with what that original plan was. And yet they still think there's planning going on. The, plan the planning is about the process of is about the process of adaptation. Yeah. The planning is to create the institutions to be able to modify what you're doing collectively. So it's it's still planning. Mm -hmm. It's just not planning it to achieve a preordained comprehensive idea. And I would argue in the water realm, we ought to be worried about IWRM as an ideal because it presumes there are institutions with the authority, with the power, with the knowledge to integrate across all of these multiple dimensions in spite of the fact that we have created the silos that you alluded to and that there are contending interests trying to pursue and maximize different outcomes for from their standpoint that are good from their standpoint. So for the reasons I worry about comprehensive planning, I worry about IWRM. So any, any other thoughts regarding IWRM? I think something related to what we were just talking about is like the interesting fact that in some ways the IWRM is like very broad. But then in other ways, a lot of people criticize it for not being broad enough, um, saying that like the adaptive water management system like needs to replace or augment the IWRM because that um, is moving toward that like, can we not only create water management, but can we make sure that this water management system is also going to be adaptable to the future because we have to assume that it's not constant when we look at these extreme weather patterns or um, like changes in the nature of a conflict some of these IWRM um, like management scenarios are just not like actively trying to adapt and become better to adjust to these changes. So in a lot of ways, people are saying like, oh, the IWRM is not enough. Like, what about the nexus? What about this like adaptive water management system? And so like in my memo, I talked a lot about how, um, I think one of the readings tried to analyze whether or not like you could replace the IWRM. And I thought it was really interesting that they touched on like the social value of the IWRM. Like it's taken a long time to be adopted because like a lot of the water policy, water diplomacy sector is like, if well-respected water diplomats use a certain water management system, then like it's more likely to be used somewhere else, not just I guess like how some business models or other like sectors might transfer a certain system. So I just think that the, the IWRM's value, the fact that it is water centric is like, I think very like a strength of the IWRM. And then the fact that in the nexus, water is um, not considered more valuable or important than these other like sectors that you're considering in the nexus, whether or not it's like the food, water, energy nexus, where like every sector needs to be treated equally. I think like the fact that the IWRM puts the water 
like as the most important entity, even though it is maybe creating some boundaries that the nexus wants to like get rid of, I think is still really valuable because if you like get too broad, it's hard to make any progress, but maybe I've misinterpreted. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like the future needs to be like more understanding and expansive and multi-centric, but also like how do we make progress if we can't get all those people to sit at the table and make an agreement in any regard? Yeah, I, I think yeah, uh, in terms of um, uh, theoretical aspect, uh, of course, the IWRM is very interesting. And uh, But in terms of practice, um, this is the main limitations that to uh, implement this theoretical framework in practice, this is highly criticized and uh, this um, implementation um, through um, a, a actual uh, following the actual process of the framework, it, I, I haven't done, uh, I haven't seen any um, studies that really uh, went through the IWRM uh, implementation. Uh, so that is the main challenging thing that the uh, implementation of IWRM uh, is, uh, is, is very difficult and is uh, is one of the um, unachieved goal of the IWRM. That, that's the main criticism. But in terms of the uh, theoretical contribution that has been done, is I think uh, is, is, is highly valuable at the broader level. But for implementing, uh, it needs kind of um, yeah so, some kind of um, implementation oriented approach. Uh, that, that's how I, I see. So. Any, any thought at all? In practice, I mean, I guess, I mean, just in practice, I guess you would hope that negotiators would would have enough or be able to bring enough. I mean, this is obviously very dependent on, on what the kind of initiating circumstances are of any negotiation, but have enough flexibility to, to draw upon kind of various frameworks as they, as needed and as, as beneficial to a specific dispute, whether or not you know they call it IWRM um, or not, you know the limitations of the IWRM, whether it's in terms of scale or in terms of of kind of what's not included because of its water centric focus, like can be supplemented by drawing off of some of the other nexus, some of the nexus approaches, as as you know you know the other others have said already. That if you are kind of in the process of negotiating a dispute, you ideally should be able to kind of pick and choose to an extent and not, not be totally didactic about, about how you apply these frameworks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't know how you analyze it then if you're looking at it so holistically, but it, it's hard for me to imagine any, any one framework being able to wholly encompass kind of all of the possibilities of, of, of a water dispute. Mm -hmm. I, I think starting with a dispute is um, going to get you into a corner you don't need to be in. S start with the fact that you need to manage water. Yeah. There's, not, there's not a dispute. You just you have water and you have competing demands and you have competing interests and you have to manage the water. Okay, what would be a good way to manage the water? Uh, to involve entities with broad authority or multiple authorities or narrow, just water, to, to involve uh, only the most expert people to make the decisions or to engage the stakeholders affected by the decisions so there's support for whatever the decision is to go ahead with. Would it make more sense to look just narrowly at the water that you have responsibility for because you're within a political boundary? Or would it make more sense to look at the water system moving underground or above ground that affects the water that you have responsibility for? Because the answers to those three kinds of questions almost always lead to people saying broader, linked, more comprehensive, 
more participatory, more completely engaged, because it, it seems like a better way to manage water. Now, assume there's a dispute within that water management system. How would you expect it to be resolved? Well, if you had pulled in all of those actors and all of those interests and all of that knowledge and all of that authority to manage the water and there was a dispute within that, <coughs> you'd probably have to engage all of those same elements in sorting out a dispute that emerged. It would be hard to, to say, oh, there's a dispute. Now all of you who are involved in the planning of this and the management of this, go away and the three of us will solve this. It's, it's not gonna happen. So IWRM isn't a dispute resolution mechanism. IWRM is an approach to water management. And when disputes come up, it's all tangled up in the dispute resolution process because of what it took to do IWRM as the planning, as, as the management scheme. It, it's never, it was never meant to be a dispute resolution strategy or mechanism, but it's tangled up with efforts at dispute resolution because it's kind of hard to shrink any of the dimensions, the parties, the interest, the scope of the problem, the institutional powers for purposes of resolving a dispute that's come up within the IWRM process. Are there models, I mean, could you, could you differentiate and say, and say the, um, you know, the initial, as you said, any, any, you know, anyone who thinks through the three questions you ask is going to move out and, and say, you know, broader, more inclusive, greater scope for this. Could you differentiate and say, okay, the initial water management uh, consider like, um, you know, negotiations will, will um, kind of exist on this macro level and incorporate kind of many different kind of facets of, of, of the economy and, and, and kind of secondary tertiary effects of water management. But then you say after that, you basically incorporate dispute resolution processes that are hyper local, that that are specific to to kind of the area where the where the resolution or where the dispute is taking place, and don't require you know completely remapping all of the old terrain. That historically, that's what the law and regulation have in fact done. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. We have a system of water rights that has nothing to do with IWRM. I'll just take California or take Western <laughs> United States. IWRM, you would plan that water in a certain way, but you can't in a system that's defined senior water rights where people who got there first got the water and then nobody can tell them what to do with it and they can waste it, they can do anything they want. It's completely contrary to the ideas of IWRM. And uh, until relatively recently, the whole water law around the world is not connected to water management. The rules of water law come down almost it, it, in the way, Aaron, you're describing. It just how, how can I localize this and situate it in the way we deal with other property rights? And that's how we'll handle the dispute. But it doesn't, it doesn't fit with what we imagine is the broader scope and the need to take account of more interests and the desire to look at the interconnectedness of things and the need to look ahead, not back at who had what rights, but forward in terms of who has what needs. And yet we're stuck with it. So again, IWRM is a water management approach. It's, it's easy to see how it evolved. And it seems perfectly logical. And it doesn't, it doesn't offer an obvious or easy way of handling disputes over water within systems that are managed by IWRM. 
And if you just tried to solve this water disputes in a purely legal fashion that determines who has what senior rights and hey, that's it, it's property. But that doesn't take account of water as a shared human resource or as a human right. And now how do we solve disputes over the allocation of water? We can't use the property rights law. We need something else. Yeah, that makes sense. And Amesh, how do you react to what I just said? Yeah, I, I um, so in terms of a relation with IWRM and water diplomacy, I see that um, IWRM says, um, according to IWRM principle or, or dimensions, um, water should be managed in a transboundary or watershed or uh, ecological boundary. Um, so in that case, I can see the relation with the IWRM and water diplomacy because um, when I say that water should be managed in a watershed or transboundary scale, that means it definitely um, um, crosses boundary of um, ecological boundary with the political boundary and it can immediately create institutional mismatch and that can be managed through uh, diplo water diplomacy uh, approach. So that's how I can see uh, a relation with IWRM. So I can see water diplomacy can be useful for the um, difficulties that have IWRM implementation can be somehow um, uh, implemented uh, through incorporating water diplomacy approach. That's, that's how I feel um, uh, the uh, relation of IWRM and water diplomacy. Do you want to go to your next slide and, and look at the principles of IWRM explicitly in light of the general discussion we've had? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are just a historical perspective of IWRM. So according to, um, so it has started from the UN conference on water in Mar del Plata in 1977, then in 1992, uh, Dublin conference. Uh, this is the main building block for developing the IWRM um, principles. And in, in this uh, conference, uh, these four principles has been considered. So the principle number one is the fresh water is finite and vulnerable resources essential to sustain life, development and the environment. So here you can compare the uh, thinking of the water diplomacy. So it's completely um, opposite of the thinking of the Dublin principle where water diplomacy framework considered water is the flexible resource in, instead of um, finite and vulnerable uh, resource. So how the conflicting situation can be, um, um, yeah, can be considered as the cooperative thinking that, that can be a major shift of thinking uh, in terms of principles of IWRM and uh, water diplomacy. So in terms of principle number two, uh, water diplomacy and management should be based on a participatory approach involving users, planners, and uh, policy makers at all levels. And another important principle is the women should be a part of the um, decision making process like provision, management, and safeguarding of water, specifically considering the role of um, women in the developing country, how they are involved, closely involved with the water resource management and uh, yeah, services of the water resources. And the fourth and final principle is that uh, water has an economic value in all its um, components recognized as an economic um, uh, resource. So these are the four principles of Dublin um, conference in 1992. And then um, another event um, where IWRM uh, was first established is um, 
second uh, world order from an ministerial conference in the Hague, where it's considered that um, equity criteria um, along with subsidiary um, uh, subsidies to poor. This is also considered as, as, a, as a principle of IWRM. And then uh, it, it is declared in the International Conference on uh, Fresh Water in Bonn, 2001. And then uh, World Summit on Sustainable uh, Development in 2002. Um, so now, um, based on these principles, IWRM has been, as, as you can see uh, from the Global Water Partnership definition that um, IWRM is considered as a process uh, which um, promotes the coordinated development and management of water, land, and related resources uh, in order to maximize the resultant economic and social welfare in an equitable manner and without compromising the sustainability of the vital ecosystems. So it, 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 don't, it incorporates theoretically multiple aspects like it's, it's considered as a planning process as um, Larry already uh, mentioned, and it incorporates the coordinated uh, development like TBA kind of development pattern, which incorporates not only water resources, but also um, water and related uh, resources that are linked with water can be managed together for maximizing the economic and social uh, welfare with an equity basis of uh, considering the sustainability of the ecosystems. So th that is the broader de definition of IWRM. And probably you have reading this um, uh, criticism by uh, Osit Bissas and um, uh, where he mainly criticized the, uh, the, the vague definition of integration what issues needs to be integrated and uh, how it can be a process. And um, um, so, so in terms of operational point of view, um, he identified this vagueness and in terms of theory uh, is fine, but in terms of implementation, how this can be applied in a, a given context, this is completely vague. That's what his uh, message is uh, broadly regarding IWRM. So uh, we try to identify um, main dimensions of IWRM. So these are the uh, dimensions that in our um, studies that we try to identify. So uh, first uh, dimension is integrated management. And the second dimension is the river basin or watershed uh, should be the special scale for managing water resources and um, water governance or um, institutional um, mechanism for governing water is, is very important and involving stakeholders and uh, public participations is also one of the key dimensions of IWRM and consideration of water as an economic good is, 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 a, is an um, important consideration of IWRM and also ensuring gender equity and uh, social um, um, yes social capital is is one of the main uh, dimensions so these are the seven dimensions of the IWRM and um, here I can see as I, I, were, I, I was mentioning that river basin as a specialist scale and uh, to um, implement this river basin for water resources ma management, it certainly creates conflict. And for managing that, water diplomacy can play a, a, um, uh, an important role for uh, managing water resources. For integrated ma management, there are criticisms that what needs to be integrated, and that's also depends on the um, uh, specific context and a specific 
context by engaging stakeholders what issues needs to be integrated can be decided and can be um, um, yeah um, it, it uh, can be considered in a negotiation table um, that, that can be part of the um, implementation part of IWRM through uh, water diplomacy uh, approach. So that's how I, I consider that uh, for implementing IWRM, the uh, criticism that has in the literature, some of the criticism can be overcome uh, when we consider the water diplomacy approach. That's, that's how I see. I don't know. Um, Larry, what would be your opinion on the linkage between IWRM and water diplomacy? Well, uh, I, I thought your description was very reasonable. Um, I'm, I start with the problems in practice and maybe that's why I'm less tolerant of some of the fuzziness and some of the ambiguity in IWRM, the way it's been written about um, and the way it emerged. I mean, calling water an economic good leads to the notion that you should get the prices right if you want to protect the environment, if you want to protect the water. But as soon as you start talking about getting the prices right, you're assuming water is a commodity. And if you think water should be a right, then the price is not relevant. And thinking of it as an economic good is not helpful. And some of you know, I, I'm working on the problem of water shutoffs in American cities, where people who can't pay their bill for their water for a month or two have their water shut off. Well, they can't pay their bill because they're out of work. And telling them they have to pay their bill isn't going to make it possible for them to pay their bill. And then the next thing that the water department does is it calls the family services department and says, take the children out of that home. There's no water there. It's, it's not hygienic. So their kids are taken away. They still can't pay the bill. And then the next thing that happens is the city puts, sells the lien, it's an economic instrument, on the, on the debt because the city needs money to pay to maintain the water system. And if people don't pay their bills, it doesn't have the money, it can't maintain the system. So it sells the debt to private money lenders who then come after the person on a daily basis and saying, not only do you owe us the $900 from the last four months, now the interest rate, and we've just increased it to 10% interest. They can't pay the debt, they can't pay the interest. And then after a year, the city says, we're gonna sell your house to recoup the, the mounting debt. We have all kinds of cities in the United States where the water authority sells liens and forecloses on homes, all because people couldn't pay the fee for water because they lost their job. Now, we, we have laws that don't allow the electricity company to turn off electricity in the winter if you can't pay your bill, because the presumption is you'll die. But we don't have comparable laws that say you can't shut off people's water. Now, during COVID, very interestingly, we have had a moratorium on water shutoffs in some cities. Because now the presumption is people have a good excuse for being unable to pay their bills. But before, somehow, they didn't have an excuse, like they lost their job. This is all a function of thinking of water as an economic good. What if we said every residential property gets a certain minimum amount of water that you need to stay alive? It doesn't cost anything. And then all the water above that, you pay a price relative to your ability to pay. Well, we never had in the United States a system of water fees based on ability to pay 
until last year when Philadelphia passed the first municipal law saying that they wanted to move in a different direction and have people pay for some portion of their water relative to their ability to pay. And you can imagine the legal battle that's now ongoing about whether that's okay or not. But all of that is stems from the idea that water is a commodity and we should have to buy and sell it. And Australia, when it saw that it was running out of water, fresh water, and had all terrible forest fires and other difficulties, bought as a government all the water rights in one state back from the owners at a prevailing price per hectare. And then it paid back the money by selling back the water rights, but on a different basis to people to try to have greater equity in the availability of water. So it built a whole system based on water as an economic good in order to address a common need where if we thought of water as a natural resource and as a common resource, pricing wouldn't be the focus, right? And we've tried to make a market out of everything in the, in the Western capitalist countries. And so now we have problems of water being unavailable to different groups of people. And I, I worry that IWRM is about maximizing water as an economic good. That's one of the seven principles or whatever that you had listed. Water is an economic good. Um, and there are several of the principles I understand completely where they came from. But when I look in practice, the problem is we have underinvestment in the capital improvements necessary to get water to people that need it. And there's not a way to solve that through integrated water resource management. That's a political, ethical, moral decision. So a lot of the conflicts, some of which don't rise to the level of a formal conflict because the poor, the disadvantaged, the marginalized don't have the political clout to make it a fight. But in fact, there's a conflict with very large numbers of people in different parts of the world unable to get adequate water because there's no way to pay the capital cost to build the desalination plant, to build the water movement system to get water from one place to another. So that's what I, I worry about IWRM causing conflict and not providing a pathway to resolution of conflicts, given some of the principles it includes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I had I had a different perspective to what you just said. For example, if um, if a poor person in my country uh, doesn't have access to clean water, um, he he's like installing a hand pump or something at the cost of thousand dollars or something, it's an additional burden to his daily income. Uh, what if the state state would have provided him a, a water supply network with some certain pricing and the state had ensured that that water was clean enough to drink like for example I, I in Pakistan can't drink water directly from tap I'm not sure about drinking water directly from the tap but here in in my uh, residence in Ithaca I drink water directly from tap so uh, by this I'm saving money from the bottled water and then I'm saving money for installing my own boring system or pumping system. So if the state provided me with clean water with certain price in which they are maintaining the infrastructure, which is lesser than the amount which I am spending back home on bottled water and boring uh, water uh, costs like do well or something like that, then do you, don't you think that the approach would be much better? The pricing, water pricing approach would be better in this scenario? Um, you're paying rent in Ithaca that includes water cost. 
And if you lived in Flint, Michigan, you would be paying not that much different rent, but you couldn't drink the water from the tap because it's been allowed to become contaminated. And the city doesn't have the resources to rebuild the whole system. So we've pushed on to individuals the cost of getting water in some cities where we've allowed the water to become contaminated. Maintaining clean water is, a, I would argue, a common cost, not an individualized cost. While you can go buy water in bottles, we still expect the availability of clean water from the tap, drinkable water that won't kill you, to be a common cost. If it's a common cost, then we should collect taxes from everybody in a progressive way and take care of building the things that are common, like clean water system. So I know, I, I heard the comparison you're making, but I would argue both in Pakistan and in the United States, that the responsibility of local government should be to provide drinkable water for people as a capital cost that's a collective cost. And whether that cost is paid for from taxes, which could be collected in a progressive way, or fees, which typically are not collected in a progressive way, they don't look at ability to pay, I think we can have that debate about what's the fair way to collect the money. But once the money is collected, it should be used to get everybody a minimum amount of clean water. That, that's my argument. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that also fits with the IWRM principle like social equity and um, uh, yeah, so. Well, but yes, and and, and uh, to add to your point that uh, I mean, it is a, IWRM is a collective approach. It's, it's not about governments only. It's about people also, society, societal yeah. education. For example, if you're doing, you just said, use the word contamination. Who is doing contamination? We are doing contamination. We are uh, mixing sewage water with water. We are doing water thefts. We are doing hold to the main water supply line to get more water for ourselves. That is something related to the, to the societal education. If we do not educate people that, water should be treated as a precious resource that it should not be contaminated. It's like, it's like a joint responsibility, not the responsibility of government only. I agree. I agree. Um, you'll have to excuse me. I'm trying desperately to get the folks planning Glasgow to approach the problem in a different way than they did in Paris. And uh, they have chosen this hour uh, at least I have a chance to talk to them. Um, I'm, I'm not making any progress. This is the third try, uh, but I, I feel obliged. Uh, if they just meet in Glasgow and do again what they did in Paris, we're doomed. And there has to be a different discussion. And um, there's a group of us who are trying to promote a different global discussion on this question. So I'm, I'm going to disappear. But the, the, the conversation about IWRM is important because you need, each of you needs to formulate, to take a stand, to formulate an idea of how you think water should be managed and how you think disputes over the management of water should be resolved. And I don't think either Anamesh or I uh, thinks we know all the answers and I don't think there's only one solution for all places and all times, uh, but we need to be thinking prescriptively. And if the best language we could say is, uh, uh, social needs are important. Common good should be taken into account. Water should be managed in a comprehensive fashion. Look at the linkage between water and everything else. I, I don't think that inspires action or policy. I think it's too vague. So I'm pushing you to think in more explicit prescriptive terms and then to be able to argue for it, for that view. 
Uh, before you leave, can you just tell me the questions you are you're going to address in this meeting? Yes. What should be done before the meeting by the people who will be coming to the meeting while they can still formulate new policy choices? Because once you're at the meeting, all you do is argue about the text that's been sent out. And every 197 delegations have been sent there with very explicit instructions by their country. There's no problem solving that can happen at the meeting. Mm -hmm. But before the meeting, everyone is busy figuring out what they want everybody else to do. There's no joint planning beforehand that, and it, because it can't be done in an official way. If it's done an official way, then everybody's there reading the script from their country saying everybody else is responsible. This is a problem, that's a problem. Nothing can happen. So we're trying to get a different kind of conversation amongst a substantial number of the people who will be at the conference representing their countries into conversations between now and the summer, not in their official capacity, just in terms of problem solving and not just technical, the others as well. But people say, well, how would you decide who participates? And my argument is it doesn't matter. They're not gonna decide anything. They're just gonna put forward good proposals. Let's just have a diverse group that wants to put forward proposals in the collective interest. Well, where would you have it? When would you have it? I said, it doesn't matter. We do it online. We just need to start work on new proposals of a different kind. And the question that I'm saying that the proposal should be about what help does your country need to get to net zero by 2030? Not what's your responsibility for cutting stuff. What help do you say you want, need to get to net zero by 2030? And collect that and look at the differences amongst what countries say they want and need. And then figure out how different countries can help each other work toward that as the goal. 2030 net zero, that's what we have to aim for. But now all we have is how much of the overrun will you agree to accept no matter what it costs you? And the answer is you can't make me do it. And that's Paris. And we're going to get it again in Glasgow. So that's that's what I'm the conversation I'm trying to promote. Forgive me. Yeah. I will see you all next week. <laughs> So, um, Mashtub, you wanted to say something, uh, maybe quickly, because yes. we only have. Uh, I have a very small left. question. That is, uh, I agree with the with Larry's argument that there should be a minimum uh, amount of water for every household or every person instead of uh, putting them extreme pressure uh, through the capitalist system. This is I completely agree, but at the same time. Uh, uh, in my country, I've seen, and probably have seen also that when something is free, or whatever the amount that is, when something is free, uh, most of the people, and that, has, that is, I've seen from my observation, and I'm sure that the research, if anyone does it, would give the similar data, uh, that when something is free, there is a tendency to waste. And in Bangladesh or in a in developing country, a huge number of people, uh, they would be not that rich to afford it. So the government would be giving them a massive amount of water in total. And, and if everybody wastes just a little or the majority of the people waste just a little, that's a huge amount of water being wasted. Yes, because it's free. And yes, because it's free, people do not value it that much. So uh, I was thinking that how do we make a mechanism to stop that? Is there any mechanism at all? So that was my question. Yeah, I think that uh, in terms of IWRM principle, the mechanism is there. So uh, we need to um, um, yeah, place a price on the water and yeah, on equity basis, the price uh, could be different for different um, um, group of people and that that can helps efficiency of water use and this that, that is kind of demand side management of water 
resources that is needed for uh, yeah, um, uh, increasing water, water um, use efficiency. So yeah, the mechanism is there in terms of theoretical aspect, but for implementing in um, Bangladesh or in specific countries is, is, yeah, there are problems. So maybe uh, now we can discuss water energy and food nexus. The uh, still we need to. So um, water energy and food nexus. This is another important paradigm of water resources management. Sometimes it's called separate paradigm, but sometimes it's uh, within integrated water resources management where the integration was big in the IWRM, and in this case. This uh, sectoral integration is explicitly mentioned, like uh, integration of water, energy, and food. But it could be also water, energy, food, climate, water, energy, um, yeah, um, climate ecosystem. So it depends on the context. But the um, thinking of the nexus is uh, it, it comes from system integration. Um, so how the global systems are interconnected and how um, the traditional silo process um, is um, uh, diminishing the importance of system level outcome. And that's, that's why the nexus uh, concept came. So for example, um, uh, if, if I ask you what you have eaten in the breakfast, maybe a banana, and in that, banana is not only uh, food, but also it incorporates huge amount of water um, for producing the banana, but also um, transportation um, uh, and also um, from the agricultural field to coming into the uh, food breakfast table, it, it, it um, uh, consumes huge amount of energy. And if you um, don't, um, if you waste that banana, then you can um, calculate how much energy and water has also been wasted from producing to, so this kind of thinking is, is the um, uh, nexus thinking. So if you can increase the efficiency of water use in one sector, that can also help increasing efficiency in the energy sector and also food sector. And that, that's how the water energy food um, nexus concept came, not only in the uh, household perspective, not only in the urban aspect, but also in the transboundary water resources ma management aspect. Uh, so the nexus uh, concept builds on many of these approaches and um, and it's, it's, it, it also incorpor incorporates this integrated process. I, I already shared this article. Probably you have um, read this article and it's, it's interesting because it clearly identifies um, the synergies and trade-offs of, um, of water resources um, ma management within water energy and food nexus and how, um, how the um, incorporating nexus thinking can helps increase the efficiency of water resources management. So for example, this nexus thinking uh, can uncover synergies of, and co-benefits. Um, the example that is given in the um, London um, urine separation uh, technology that helps reducing 10% of water uh, niche reduction, but um, also eventually the, this also um, uh, helps reducing energy use in water supply by 10% and wastewater treatment by 25%. So by using simple urine separation uh, technology that uh, this um, helps reducing um, water niche, um, energy niche and wastewater uh, treatment need, but also it helps capturing nutrient. For example, um, uh, 2,300 tons of uh, phosphorus and 24,000 tons of nitrogen annually um, can be separated. That can be utilized for 
producing a million tons of um, wheat in uh, in uh, UK. So you you can see how the synergies and co-benefits can be achieved by uh, applying this water energy food um, nexus approach. Um, but also, um, it, it can detect um, harmful trade-off. For example, uh, in Egypt uh, and Spain, the water demand comparison uh, is 75% uh, higher than Spain in Egypt. But uh, because the, uh, in Egypt, it considers gravity-oriented uh, irrigation system, which requires mass water, but at the same time, it can, uh, the, the uh, energy consumption is three times lower than the Spain, because in um, um, Spain, it, 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 um, uh, it, considers not the gravity irrigation, but um, uh, energy driven drip irrigation system. So if we convert the irrigation system in, um, in uh, Egypt, then the water is saved, but at the same time, the um, uh, energy and carbon dioxide production rate has uh, increased significantly. So this kind of trade-off can be considered by um, considering this um, nexus approach. And also, um, um, I think Jima uh, was mentioning about the biofuel. And uh, here is, is the example of, of biofuel, um, how the in increased consumption of uh, biofuel is promoted uh, as an alternative of uh, oil and gas. But at the same time, it, it can clear huge amount of water scarcity and food, uh, food sustainability uh, in the United States, but also in the other countries. So um, the, the unexpected consequences uh, can be taken into account by considering this uh, nexus approach. So um, also in terms of integrated planning and decision making and governance, this auto energy food nexus is very important. Uh, let's consider the transboundary aspect. So here, uh, in terms of water energy and food nexus in the transboundary context, um, if you see the relation between water and food, and um, for the uh, food production, you must need water. And uh, in the upstream, um, water uses for the agriculture can affect also in the uh, downstream. And uh, this can, so the water and food are highly re uh, relevant in the transboundary context, but also uh, food affect water resources. For example, um, it, um, can uh, through intensifying agricultural practices and land use changes by agricultural um, expansion, this can affect water quantity by changing the runoff, but also it can affect um, eutrophication and, and um, salinization um, and affects water quality. But at the same time, um, if you see the relation between water and energy. For the energy production, of course, you need um, water. And uh, energy production also affects um, water quality and quantity. For example, um, if um, the hydropower production for energy affects uh, water quality in terms of um, changing water temperature and, and also um, so the water temperature can change quickly by storing water in a in a uh, dam, and that can also affect changing the water quality parameter. So thus, you, you can see that these linkages are important for um, transboundary context. In this study um, done by the Keskin and Etel, they try to compare um, three. Um, uh, transboundary areas uh, in uh, the Central Asia, mainly the Aral Sea, um, South Asian context, uh, Ganges Brahmaputra, and in the um, 
Mekong uh, region, the Mekong River Basin, and they try to um, qualitatively analyze this uh, interrelation between the water energy and food, um, and the um, uh, the, the uh, thickness of the line can determine uh, how the uh, relationship um, established and uh, what are the strength of the relationships uh, are, are um, determined by the thickness of the of the um, line. For example, in the case of um, Central Asia, the, um, the 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 impact of food on water is highly um, important there, but also impact of energy production on downstream water flow is, is also important. Um, in the case of South Asia, the impact of um, uh, the, the, the importance of water on agricultural production between the upstream and downstream is very important. So that's how they found. So this kind of uh, qualitative uh, relationships for water resources ma management within the water energy food nexus has been established. So um, in terms of uh, how the um, water energy food nexus is important for water diplomacy. So as, as you have seen that the, uh, the identifying synergies and trade-offs beyond water and um, river basin management scale is, is um, provide an scope for water um, diplomacy, but, but also the mutual benefit and promoting value creation, the water energy food nexus uh, give a clear um, uh, value added for, um, for a water negotiation. For example, hydropower, linking hydropower, uh, agricultural production and, and um, water management can help achieving, um, um, can, can, can help creating multiple benefits and multiple co-benefits and multiple value that helps um, uh, water negotiation very uh, easily. But, but also, um, Water energy food nexus promote um, business idea, and that can also uh, linked into the negotiation table and can can help reducing the um, uh, the the, the um, conflict and can uh, can be uh, can create a cooperative environment. So these are the ideas that uh, water energy food nexus can support um, promoting the water diplomacy. That, that, that's how I see. So uh, here is a, a, a reference. I, I'll put them in the uh, Canvas site. I found just recently so I can share this um, article so that you can have an understanding how water energy food nexus can be um, useful for water di diplomacy and also how water diplomacy can help implementing water energy food nexus approach. Just Quickly, um, sustainable development goals. Um, you know, the sustainable development uh, goal has been um, considered in 2015 to meet the target by 2030. And in order to move from M disease to S disease, uh, it considers 17 S disease and uh, with 169 targets and, and S disease six, um, is um, the ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And it incorporates SDG 6.5 that um, we need to implement IWRM um, through transboundary cooperation. So the, uh, the goal um, 6.5 or target 6.5 specifically on uh, implementation of IWRM for, um, for uh, cooperation, uh, incorporating transboundary co cooperation. So uh, here is the linkage of SDGs and and um, IWRMs, but but also the way IWRM is um, considered as a as an indicator. Um, it it is kind of there is um, criticism on this because IWRM is very broader concept and theoretical concept, but the way the IWRM is considered as UN 
sustainable goals there are a strong crit uh, criticism on that because it considers very vague way of uh, putting numbers on IWRM and how they uh, uh, measuring the progress uh, is, is is very um, uh, yeah is, is very debatable but you know this is one of the major paradigm that um, internationally acknowledged and and um, th that's why um, IWRM uh, is very important and also um, uh, with relation to um, uh, SDGs and water diplomacy I see that uh, many SDG goals are interlinked and it can create um, synergies and trade-offs. So for example, if I can meet one SDG target, uh, for example, renewable energy production and for the renewable energy production, uh, it's not um, specifically um, defined uh, uh, which kind of renewable energy can be produced. So that can promotes idea of um, um, hydroelectric uh, electricity generation. So that can also uh, affect implementation of um, IWRMs because if you promote um, upstream water development projects for hydroelectricity, then that, this can affect a relationship uh, with, um, uh, with the downstream countries. So this kind of synergies and trade-offs are very important and that can be um, reduced or that can be resolved through uh, diplomacy approach broadly. So that's how I can see the link between the SDGs and and um, and the water diplomacy aspect in, in general. So th that's, that's um, we wanted to um, discuss today classes. So first we already discussed the evolution of water resources ma management, uh, how it came from the supply side approach to the um, demand and um, decentralized approach with an example. But then we already discussed uh, IWRM and its importance um, in the um, international water resource ma management aspect and its relation with the um, water diplomacy but also we discussed um, water energy, food nexus and sustainable development goals and its relation with uh, water diplomacy. Yeah, so the next class will be the week after and in that class will play a uh, role play simulation, practically how we can resolve uh, water conflicts. Uh, in, uh, we'll play the game uh, Indopotomia uh, River um, uh, basin management and for the role play simulation uh, we will need nine players but we have six players so uh, do you know is there uh, any of your friend could be interested in the role play simulation um, if, if you don't find I will try to find three other players but yeah if you have uh, uh, yeah interesting um, uh, colleagues that are highly interested to the to understand the role play game you can uh, let me know yeah so another um uh notice or announcement is that next week um larry and me are going to talk on transboundary water resources ma management larry will discuss mainly the theoretical aspect and i will describe the um uh, Brahmaputra river basin case. So if you are interested, you, uh, you can join in this event. I can share the link for the uh, registration. It's the um, uh, EU time. So it's the European time. Um, so in uh, US time, it could be 11, 11 a.m. or yeah. So if you are interested, you, you, you uh, feel free to join this in this event. Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, another announcement. Sorry, I wanted to put in the uh, put it in here. There is a discussion paper on water energy and food nexus, and um, th th there is a discussion series is um, taking place by one of our colleague uh, who is the editor of the journal. Water um, Hydrological Sciences Journal. 
and in that discussion paper there is a topic on water energy and food nexus and if you are interested and if you feel um, it's fit in your area of interest there is a paper on water quality and water energy food nexus and if you can criticize or um, uh, comment on that paper that can also be published um, if this is a uh, concise and and um, yeah, in a uh, written in a scientific way. So I can share that link if you are interested in participating this kind of um, writing. Uh, you can let me know. I, I have the link as with the editor of that journal. So I can share with you um, if you are interested. So the write up should be one or two pages, uh, but it should be written in a scientific way. Yeah. So I, I will share those two links and also I will share the uh, role play simulation, um, uh, both the general instruction, but also confidential instruction for his player. I, I will share uh, with you in, in next uh, few days. Yeah. So, bye.